there everyone uh, today I want to do a video on this EMP shield that I recently got my hands on uh, I've been hearing about these for a while now and I've really wanted one this one is to put in your vehicle they sell a bunch of different types uh, but instead of me you know kind of going over this and giving you my opinions about it what I decided to do was talk to the guys who actually invented it so I uh, got on the phone with Andrew and recorded a video of that that phone call and we talked about the different types of these they have they have them for boats they have them for rvs uh, ham radios we talked about that quite a bit uh, radio gear all sorts of different things for your home you can hook it up to your breaker box a uh, really cool solution when it comes to i you know for a, a vehicle uh, a solution for an emp is pretty tough to find and this was pretty cool so uh, but anyway, instead of me just rambling on here about how great I think this thing is, uh, we'll get the actual inventors and the guys that put this together and uh, talk about the testing they did and uh, why this will work. Uh, so anyway, let's go ahead and get into that. All right. Hey there, everyone. Uh, so instead of me doing a review on this EMP shield, I decided to get a hold of the guys who really know what they're talking about. Uh, this product is kind of hard to do a review on because you just don't know until, you know, something happens. Hopefully that never does. But uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I've got Andrew on with us. And Andrew, why don't you explain what EMP Shield is all about, how long you guys have been around, and um, some of, you know, how this technology works. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, for everybody who's watching, I'm Andrew. I'm, I'm a co-owner of EMP Shield. I'm also serving as the marketing director. And EMP Shield's been around for almost a year now. Uh, we became an official company uh, the 1st of January, 2019. And what we offer is a series of technologies uh, for EMP protection for the home um, as, a, as a very beneficial side effect that also serves as 100% lightning. Um, to date, we have about 42 uh, products within our civilian line and then also separate technologies that we do for DOD contracting, government type stuff as well. Oh, very cool, yeah. Yeah, uh, you have just looking at your website and I'll make sure I'll leave a link below. Uh, mm -hmm. You have it says on there motorcycles, Marines, cars, solar. Yes. Uh, home. I mean, you can put one in your your home fuse box. Uh, mm -hmm. the one I have is the one for your cars. Uh, and I've got a couple of questions about this, too. Basically, absolutely super easy to hook up uh, and you just hook it up. You attach this to inside your your motor, your engine compartment, mm -hmm. um, hook these up to the battery. Uh, super easy to hook up in the future i plan on getting one uh i'm doing a battery bank right now and i plan mm -hmm. on getting one for that how exactly you know i know with with cars how an emp could affect cars and yep. honestly we don't really know what depending on the vehicle and what might happen sure. maybe it maybe it shuts off and doesn't turn back on what right. exactly does this do to help kind of mitigate all that would it actually shut off and then just restart or yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so first of all, there's been a couple series of tests that have been done. Um, the EMP Commission did a series of tests back in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. um, in, in which that test, they said that only a very few amount of cars will be impacted. Since then, there's been several other tests, which I don't have the, the links and documentation in front of me, but we can certainly post those later on in the show. Yeah. That do state that you know vehicles you know, around 2006 to current, they, they certainly have much more microelectronics inside of them, things yeah. like silicon arsenide. And because of the footprint of a vehicle, and also what an EMP is, which we should talk about here in a second, there is a likelihood that your vehicle can get stopped or and not turned back on after an EMP. And so let's actually talk about that, what an EMP is real quick, if okay. that's okay. Just Absolutely. There's a huge misconception about really what an EMP is. So I'll just break it down very quickly because I think this is going to be a shorter show. Um, but an EMP is, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a high altitude nuclear uh, EMP. So basically what's going to happen is a, a nuclear weapon is going to go off in the atmosphere. Um, we'll say 300 miles above the earth. And so what happens is when that bomb explodes, it goes out in all directions. So it's pushing downward and it's also pushing upward on the magnetosphere. And so for the E1 and the E2, what happens is you've got gamma radiation that's shooting down towards the atmosphere. And also following that gamma radiation is matter from the blast. And so the E1 is created from the gamma radiation hitting the atmosphere, which creates a thing called ionization. Basically what this means is the gamma radiation hits the atmosphere and freed electrons are shot off towards the earth in all visible directions. And so what an EMP is in the E1 and E2 is just freed electrons that spiral towards the earth very, very quickly. So the E1's in the nanoseconds, the E2's in the microseconds. 
and they call them pulses, but really the way I like to explain it to people who don't really know a lot about an EMP is it's just raining electrons, very, very fast, and a large amount of electricity towards yeah. the earth. So everything that's a conductor of electricity induces these electrons. So during the E1 and the E2, you know, your personal electronics, your vehicles, all of that sort of thing um, to include your home and stuff inside your home will be impacted through the induction of these electrons straight through the structure of your house or directly into your car, which has a fairly large footprint and is a lot of, it's a large conductor of electricity, right? Yeah. And vehicles do have a little bit of shielding inside them. But let's say you do have a vehicle that's modern, has microelectronics, and in this scenario induces these electrons. What's going to happen is the EMP shields uh, actually tied into your vehicle's 12 volt electrical system. It's, it's 12 volts. You know? Everything inside the vehicle runs on 12 volts. It connects to the battery and also to the chassis. And what we've done is through our testing, we realized that you can do what we call an improvised shunt to the chassis. It's an improvised grounding, basically. So the EMP shield shunts, which means pull away electricity from the electrical system very, very quickly, about 500 trillions of a second. And so what it's doing is it's passively looking for the induction of electrons and the rise in voltage. And so if this is the level that's safe within the car, once that voltage goes above this, which is called a clamping level in our device, we then push to the chassis. And we, we push the chassis to pull away from the electrical system to deter the charge and the heat from building inside the system. But what we've learned in our research is we know that when we push it to the chassis, it's going to be reinduced back into the electrical system because everything's connected in the vehicle. That's, this is a huge question we get all the time is you can't, you can't shunt to a ground inside of a car. You can because if you know that when it's reinduced, it's reinduced at a much lower level, and then you can cyclically shunt back and forth in a matter of a microsecond to deter the charge. It basically deters the heat from generating, which saves the vehicle. And so that's this, over over time. That's right. I suppose it just dissipates, and that's right. So cyclically, it does dissipate that charge, and over time is more like within the microseconds. You know, because we begin shunting yeah. in half a <laughs> nanosecond, and it goes, and the charge gets dissipated. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So because of that, you know, your car probably like some cars would shut down, and then they'd be able to restart. Your car wouldn't even probably shut down because that no, it wouldn't. That current isn't even getting to anything. That's okay. correct. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm going to be hooking this up probably this afternoon, actually, because it's supposed to snow awesome. like crazy tomorrow. So I need <laughs> yeah. to get it done. Yep, it's um, coming. Yeah. Now, the, I'm in the near future, when I get my uh, battery bank all set up, I'm going to get one mm -hmm. of these for that due. Too. Does it basically work the same way? It, it protects the, the chart that the inverters and the, the charge control. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's a great question. It's also a very common question we have. Uh, we do have solar system or solar EMP shields for your solar system. And so the way it works is you start with, uh, let's explain what happens with the solar system before I, I break it down. So a solar system has PV arrays, which has multiple solar panels. Each solar panel normally has around 5,000 uh, square feet of copper trace. 5,000 linear feet of copper trace, which is a huge collector of electricity, right? Copper and electricity go hand in hand. Copper is a very good conductor, right? And so what you have is a PV array of multiple panels serves as a microgrid that is going to induce a ton of electricity into your uh, solar system, right? And so what we do is we tie in, we have multiple models for the solar system, but we tie in the EMP shield to the very first device in that system. So normally it would be a charge controller or a inverter, whatever comes first after the PV array. And we put it there because that huge amount of electricity is going to be coming in directly through the PV array. Um, it could be anywhere from 12 volts, 24 volts, but you're not going off of your battery system. You're actually going off of the maximum input voltage from your solar panels. So mm -hmm. off-grid systems are normally 90 to 150 volts. You could go all the way up to 600 volts, depending on how big your, your panels are. Yeah, I won't be going and that so, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we do sell a lot of those. And so we, we pair it up with your system specifically. We have over 15 models for solar. And you'll tie it right in. Now, it doesn't mean it's only protecting that surge coming from the panel. It will protect everything inside that DC system, which is unique because, you know, solar, you're running DC, goes to the batteries, then inverts to AC. Um, and then in the home, you're running 120, 240. And that's why we have multiple models is because... They're, they're paired specifically for voltages and the type of electricity, whether it's DC or AC. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Now, you on your website, too, it says you have one for RVs. Uh, mm -hmm. and we do. When I see that, I think bug out vehicles because I'm a prepper, <laughs> so that's, that's kind of what I see. But yep. I, I was wondering about that because some RVs and camping, when you go camping and all that, you have the main battery that runs the mm -hmm. vehicle, and then you mm -hmm. may have an inverter with a separate battery. 
uh, on, in our pop-up, we have that where we mm -hmm. have a separate battery. With that mm -hmm. setup that you have, does that handle both of those or would you need two separate EMP? So it really depends on what you have. Now, if you have a motor home that's got a 12 volt where you drive it and then it's got 110 volts in the back, you would need two. two um, but okay. you know, if you're doing a travel trailer, you know, you'd obviously probably want one for your vehicle pulling, but if you don't plan on pulling it and you're just living inside of an RV or temporarily or whatever the case is, you would just need a 110 volt EMP shield, which yeah. would protect that. Mm -hmm. Just like a car, like if I if if I yeah. had to bug out with my truck or whatever, uh, right. sleeping in my truck, all the mm -hmm. this stuff inside the truck, the the lighter plugs and all that, that would still work mm -hmm. because it's all connected to that same battery. So that's exactly yeah. correct. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Now I was wondering too, with you think of like with extension cords and wires and all that, the the smaller the gauge, the bigger the wire. Yes. Uh, the more yep. that's going to let that electricity go through. When you think about that's an right. EMP. You've got mm -hmm. a massive amount of electricity, huge, right? huge, right? So how does this, yep. you know, handle all of that? Yep, that I love. Thank you for asking. That is, and I'm glad we get to talk. That is one of the number one questions we have. So you have to think about different things. So the first is yes, it's that's actually a very thin wire, but mm -hmm. the device will start like a normal wire. So a normal wire, you've got a, a number of amps and volts that run through it consistently. So when you're looking at our device, what we're looking at is speed. So our device is not designed to protect 200,000 amps for 20 hours. Our, des our device is designed to protect your home from a lightning strike or a very fast EMP strike that happens in nanoseconds. So the ability to use a thin gauge wire, it, it, it's actually, it's not even an issue because of the speed. So it's the speed that the event occurs and then the speed that we're able to pull the electricity from the system. A half a nanosecond is not long enough as long as we pull it in 500 trillionths of a second to generate any heat. That so that's why the wires, sense. yep, yep. Now, if we were going to, if we were going to build a device that was going to take 200,000 amps for 30 years, <laughs> the wires would be ridiculous, right? Yeah. But because it's designed to just take initial constant strikes. Um, and then the other thing is the E3. So the E3, what the device is doing. So for those of, that aren't aware of what the E3 is, it's the third phase of an EMP. And like we talked about a minute ago, when that bomb goes off, it also pushes up towards the magnetosphere. So what's happening is that magnetosphere fluctuates to try to get back into its normal state, which would be round. While it's fluctuating, it's like a magnet being waved over a piece of metal. So it is generating a low and slow voltage on the face of the earth, which could happen from anywhere from minutes to hours. Now your home, your vehicles, your personal devices are not going to be impacted by that. But the grid is going to generate a lot. It's going to induce a lot of electricity during that time which means that electricity could also be trying to come into your house so what our device does in that instance is it actually kicks the main breaker so that nothing can enter the house um, and that's why we have the little leds on the devices you'll know if you know you take a lightning strike or an e3 occurs because it's going to kick that main breaker or it's going to kick the 20 amp breaker and and do its job so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well and then that's the the main th the main difference with an amp and a solar flare is that mm -hmm. E3 effect, right? That's uh, correct. So a solar, solar flare, flare is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead and explain that a little bit. Oh, so sure. Mm -hmm. So a solar flare is very much like an E3 where you've got the, uh, you've got, what is it called? Uh, basically the radiation from the sun is hitting the magnetosphere and it's the same effect where it's a low and slow duration. Um, the only difference is when you're talking about a coronal mass ejection or a solar flare, um, we call it a CME, mm -hmm. the size could be different. So you've got the Carrington event from 1859 which was the equivalent of 2,000 nuclear weapons, or maybe it's 2 million nuclear weapons hitting the atmosphere. I mean, it's significant amount yeah. of electricity generated. You've got telegraphs that run for hours. Now, if a Carrington event happens, I don't think there's anything that can protect against that. It just doesn't exist. That's why our device is rated up to 230,000 amps. So it can take a, a, a fairly decent solar flare, but it can't take a Carrington event. Um, yeah. And that's where you know we don't know. If a Carrington event hit the Earth right now, we would go back to the Stone Age. And there's really not a whole lot that anybody could really do about it. But if you do have minor solar flares that could cause a week-long blackout, your electronics will be protected while others may not be protected. So, yeah, yeah, with the Carrington event, you know, back then they had telegraphs. We've got a whole lot more than just telegraphs these days. So. That's correct. Yes. So, yeah, that would be that would be pretty damn catastrophic. <laughs> it could. Well, and there's other things that the secondary effects from it. So you got to think about wires were glowing red things were catching on fire. So, you know, it's at that point, it's not even just electronics getting destroyed. You might have houses burning down, buildings burning down. Yeah. You know, you've got even worse things that could occur. So, yeah, those yeah. secondary and tertiary 
And then, you know, a couple of weeks down the line, that's where you get into the whole SHTF stuff and, you know, Oh yeah. (laughs) Yep. Well, that's why, that's why you want your car to be running. You know, I mean, one thing we get a lot of is, well, what's the point? I'm going to run out of gas. I would rather have a full tank of gas than have no car any day of the week. Even if it means I can only go 250 miles. If that means I go save my kids from getting killed or dying or go get a supply or something I need or get to my bug out location. I would rather have that tank of gas and a functional vehicle and then add in the fact that maybe some people do store extra gas, which I think everybody should do. Um, you know? Yeah. I, I talk about it. We talk about it all the time. I've got right. five, five gallon cans that I rotate mm-hmm. through my, you know, my, right. my truck It half full is empty. Uh, so mm-hmm. I've got plenty of, well, plenty of right. gas to last a little bit. It's not going to, you know, it, it's going right. to get me somewhere if I need to get somewhere basically. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so with this, like I said in the beginning, it's kind of hard to test these out. What mm-hmm. kind of process did you guys go through? What did you test to, you know, get yes. to the point mm-hmm. to where you, you feel comfortable saying that, yes, it's going to yep. what it's supposed to do? Absolutely. So what we did is we went to a company called Keystone Compliance. It's on the East Coast. It is a very, very well-renowned uh, electrical testing company. Um, people are welcome to look it up. All of our test results are publicly online. Um, we are actually publicly listed by the Department of Homeland Security as having passed these tests and being a qualified vendor for EMP protection. Um, but what we did is we spent a large amount of money to go prove that the device works. And we did a series of tests that are based off of military regulation that states you have to be able to do this in order to protect against this. Um, one commonly known one is military 188.125.1, um, which is a very good standard for, it's the high altitude nuclear EMP standard for the military. Um, but more importantly than that, we did a test called RS-105. And so what we did is we actually built the side of a house inside of the testing lab. Um, we did a thousand feet of Romex wire with a breaker box and an EMP shield. And we irradiated the entire room from down downwards in the entire room with 90,000 volts of electricity, which is almost double the military standard. So they say if you can protect against 50,000 volts per square meter, you're safe. We did 90,000 because after 50, we said, jack it up as high as it'll go. We just, yeah. we wanted to blow something up, you know, because yeah. we wanted to know what the, the limit was on the device too. So they gave us the ability, they, they brought us up to 90. That was the highest they could do at the time, which we were okay with. They hit it. And so we irradiated at uh, 90,000 volts per square meter. And we measured at multiple points of the wiring. So we measured at the breaker box. And then we also measured at the end of the wire. So irradiating the room, we maintained 276 volts inside of that wire with 90,000 volts in the room. So um, we're very proud of it. Um, yeah. As far as we know, it's never been done before, um, which is why we have a lot of DOD government people that we've been talking with as well, the Air Force and, and whatnot. But um, for our civilian line of products, they've all been military tested. We're also um, UL1449 certified, which is the golden standard for lightning across the United States. And we did the highest levels of testing for that series of lightning testing as well. So. Um, we're, we're a hundred percent confident. And so, you know, another thing is, um, and a lot of, most of the people that buy it are looking for EMP protection with the hopes that we never have an EMP. But like I said, in the beginning, that secondary side effect, I think we had 15 plus houses get hit last year with lightning with zero damage to the house. We had no house with any damage from lightning. Um, and we're so confident in the product and we get, we get jokes about this, like, cause we offer $25,000 of insurance. If our device fails, we cover the cost of it and it, it comes with the warranty. It's all written in the warranty. We have an insurance company that covers that cost for you. And of course the joke is, well, after an EMP, you know, <laughs> it's not going to matter, which is kind of true. But the reality is that just shows you how serious we are about our product. You know, if you yeah. get a direct lightning strike, your electrical system and everything in your house will be protected or we pay for it. Period. Well, I think if, if something like that happens, I'm going to have bigger concerns than chasing you down. So <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but we, you know, we want to show people how serious we are about this product, you know, um, yeah, yeah. We're, we're proud of what we have. It's, it's a proven technology and uh, we're, we're slowly revolutionizing the, you know, search protection industry. So, yeah, there's, there's not, especially for a vehicle, there's not, mm-hmm. I don't know if there's anything out there as far as protecting your vehicle like this, other than this. Yeah, and there's not. As you were talking about the lightning and everything too, I started mm-hmm. thinking about my ham radio equipment and I've got my mm-hmm. antenna on the roof but it's not right. tied into the, the breaker box. So is mm-hmm. there one of your products that would actually work for, for something like that? I mean, tie it to the ground rod or how would you do mm-hmm. something like that? 
Yes, sir. So we do have, I call it the hamster, but it's called the ham radio model. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it runs around $200 on the website. Uh, it is designed specifically for ham radio. Um, we have a lot of people that do uh, DHS uh, shares that use these products. We're a part of DHS shares as well. And um, so we're using this to protect because that antenna is also going to serve as a conductor for free yeah. electrons coming from an EMP. So you do need to protect the antenna and the 110 or 120, 240 side of that radio. Yeah, very. I might be buying one of those too now too. <laughs> I'm going to have to talk to my wife about all this. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get perm uh, perm permission. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Andrew, I appreciate uh, you coming yeah. in and explaining this stuff. You did a lot better job than I would have. Uh, yeah. If you can, before we get out of here, let everybody know where you guys are at, how they can get a hold of you if they need if they sure. have any questions. Sounds like you can answer just about anything anybody would have. So, uh, Oh, absolutely. Let everyone know. Yeah, so our website's empshield.com. Um, they, if they go on there right now, actually, we are we started our Black Friday week long sale. Um, you know, even if don't don't even if you don't want to buy, still go check it out. We have it's one of the largest um, sources of EMP information in the world. Um, we have the world's largest library on EMP protection information. Um, so even if you just want to go learn about EMPs, go check it out. Um, we also have some videos on how to make your own Faraday cages for like less than $6. So we're not just out here trying to sell something. We do want to just make sure people are protected. Um, and yeah, empshield.com. Our phone number is 620-412-9978. We have a sales staff that sits here all day, just talks and helps and sells. And if you, anybody has any questions and not even looking to buy, just give us a call. We'd love to talk to you. Yeah. I did notice that about your website. It's not one of those, you know, one, two page websites. There's, all the information you talked about, the testing you guys did, that's all on there. I mean, everything, yeah. there's a lot of stuff on there. So uh, yeah. I spent 15, 20 minutes and I don't know how, how far I got into it. So go down the rabbit hole. It's a pretty large yeah, website. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. all right. I appreciate it, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for being on. And, yeah. and if I have any questions in the future about my ham thing or whatever, I'll definitely be giving you guys a Give call. Give us a call. Yeah. And, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I right, appreciate it. Yep. Yeah.